Who is ready for the word of God today here at the crazy 11 a.m. service? Um, turn with me to Acts 2, 1 to 4. I want to kind of want to c- continue with the theme of Holy Spirit, but I feel like I have a prophetic word for us today. It's prophetic in nature. Um, God downloaded it in the last three days. I was at men's camping trip, and I was ducking away in my truck, turning on the air conditioning, you know, just writing and, and just praying and, and downloading what God was downloading. But Acts 2, 1 to 4 says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Everybody say suddenly. Suddenly. It's a key word for today. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to uh, them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, just like last week. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to prophesy and declare this message. It's time for my suddenly. It's time for my suddenly. I believe God wants to stir you. I believe God wants to awaken that that zeal and that pursuit within you. It's not one day. It's not someday. It's your suddenly. It's your moment right here now. So Holy Spirit, grab a hold of these moments that we have. Lord, lock every heart into what you are saying right now so that your rhema word can pierce and build and transform and forge, Lord, us into more like you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said. See, we all have suddenlies in our life, and we all, uh, at one point in time, have a suddenly. I remember back, uh, I was finishing my junior year of high school, and I remember uh, I was dating this girl, and it just wasn't working out, so I, 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 I stopped that relationship, and I made, it, I made a vow in my heart because I was on this transition with God. I was like, okay, God, I'm just going to give you my heart, and I vow that uh, I'm never going to date again until you bring the woman of my life. If, I don't want anybody else except that woman. Two weeks later, all of a sudden, Becky shows up. Literally, I made the decision. I'm like, what? All of a sudden, this beautiful blonde girl starts to stalk me and chase me down, (laughs) starts to pursue me with all her hearts. And I'm just like, whoa, God, I just wanted you. And all of a sudden, no joke, hey, listen, listen, men, I I spent two weeks in a row, I spent two to three hours on my knees with worship music playing, praying to God, is this the one? I was, it, it freaked me out. It was, it was wild. It was crazy. But, uh, man, I remember being at youth camp two months after I met Becky. And I was playing guitar, and she was singing over there, and we were singing the song Delirious. I could sing of your love forever. You know that song? And uh, I remember singing the song, and I, I, I wish I could tell you right now that I was singing that song to God. But I was, I could sing of your love forever, baby, baby, baby. I love, come, no, just like. But it was my suddenly. Becky was my suddenly. And we all have suddenlies, right? We look back in our lives and wow, that suddenly happened. And wow, that suddenly took place. And I mean, 2020, COVID was our suddenly. We didn't know that that was going to take place. And a transformation across our globe was going to start to happen. Artificial intelligence hits and all of a sudden, everything's starting to change. It's all starting to maneuver in a certain way. We didn't know that President Trump was going to get shot at and President Biden was going to step down and all of a sudden there's a change in the political arena. I mean, see, suddenlies are real. But I love our God because our God works in the realm of suddenlies. Our God is a God that when his time shows up, his time is perfect. When he comes in order and wants to shift some things, he is perfect and he's going to make it happen. You see, a friend of mine was a a carpenter and he hurt his back years ago. He hurt his back to to the point where he couldn't work. They said that his back wouldn't heal for the next 12 months. And little did he know that his suddenly was going to be 24 hours later when he opened the mailbox back in the day when mail, uh, when he opened the mailbox and, and pulled out a check that would cover his finances for the rest of the year. See, it's suddenly when God works. Last week, we talked about being baptized in the Holy Spirit and a fire. And if you want more of that fire, you want to be baptized, come and get a a prayer at the end of this service. And the ministry will will pray for you to get baptized. But there was a 15-year-old girl that came to the service. 
She didn't come up for prayer when we did the ministry time. She saw, she listened, she soaked it in, she immersed what God was doing, and guess what? 24 hours later, that Monday night, last Monday night, she was in her room on her knees and she got baptized in the Holy Spirit and she started to pray in tongues. Her suddenly came when God's perfect timing came into place. There's 167 incidences in the Bible where God comes suddenly. 167, suddenly a great host of angels appeared around the shepherds at Jesus' birth. Suddenly, an angel appeared inside of Jesus' empty tomb. Suddenly, Jesus appeared to two men walking on the road called Emmaus. The Bible says that Jesus will suddenly return when no one expects it. You have to understand, he is a God of the suddenly. And he is prophesying over you and I today, just like in the book of Acts. A moment, a supernatural suddenly is upon us. I mean, the disciples, yes, Peter and the disciples prayed for 50 days. 50 days they contended. 50 days they pressed in. And you might have been believing for 20 years. You've been believing for that miracle. For 20 years, you've been believing that for that prodigal son to come home. For 20 years, you could be on the very cusp of your suddenly. And you may not see it. You may not expect it. But get ready because God's about to show up and show off because he is a God of the suddenly. And when God prophesies, when he prophesies into the atmosphere, you got to grab a hold of it with faith. You got to grab a hold of it and say, That's mine, God. That's mine. What is being spoken right now is mine. We are in the season of suddenlies. And I saw this vision at men's camping trip. I saw this vision. I mean, it was Friday night, and man, Rich Chides, bro, he, he spoke a message on freedom and deliverance that was so powerful. Bro, you are so anointed. And the ministry of teaching has just begun, bro. Has just begun, bro. You're, it's yours, bro. It's yours. Let me just say, can we put our hands towards Rich? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, God, not just for a, a single anointing, not a, just as a double portion anointing, not just a triple. I pray for a quadruple. In Jesus' name, because this is a man of God, and, the, and this, the body of Christ needs the authority and anointing that's on his life. In Jesus' mighty name, anoint him, anoint him, anoint him, and release him in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said. Amen. I had this vision at, at a men's camping trip, and Friday night, everybody's getting ministered to, and I'm sitting on the side, I'm just weeping, I'm just looking at everybody going, Oh, gosh, man, what are you doing? This is amazing. He's not only doing a deep work in me, hitting me on personal things, but then I'm just crying, and I'm just going like this, and I saw this picture all over Colorado where just, just, just moments of lightning just striking all across every city of Colorado. And I said, God, what are you doing? And what, what, is there a storm coming to Colorado? No, no, Aaron, this is the lightning of suddenly. This is the lightning when my supernatural power is going to pull the veil aside and I'm going to come and intervene. I'm going to come invade the atmosphere of this natural realm with the supernatural of what I need to do to advance the kingdom of God. It was powerful. Can I just encourage you? Do not underestimate what God can do in just one moment. Do not underestimate the season of suddenlies. You will suddenly see the fulfillment of God's prophecies for your life. Maybe that prophecy has been sitting on the shelf, but I'm speaking and prophesying to you now. You will see the fulfillment of that. The fulfillment of God's promises. So many hundreds and hundreds of promises. Unanswered prayers. God wants to answer those prayers in this hour. But we have to understand, God Prepare me, position me, align my heart, get me, get me out of this comfort. I want to be in that place of urgency to receive your suddenly. See, I love and I value the voice of God in my life. Amen, amen, amen. Come on. In Jesus' name. Come on. Right now, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love the voice of God. I love the voice of God. But my value for the voice of God has to be represented by the value for Scripture. Because if I am not anchored in Scripture and I just go after the voice of God, I can be deceived. See, it comes to the place where the voice of God causes things to come alive. In Genesis 1, we see God speaking and all of a sudden lights. Speaking and all of a sudden water covering the earth. 
speaking one word, and all of a sudden an eagle and all of its intricacy is, is, is formed and manifested. Speaking, and all of a sudden salmon is formed for me to eat sushi in Jesus' name. All the sushi lovers, put your hands in the air and wave them around like you just don't care. See, God speaks. It's powerful. But first, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul says God's word, which is also at work amongst you as the believers. In other words, the Greek word for working or work is energetia. Energetia means that there's energy in God's word. And when, 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 when God's word is then spoken and released and manifested verbally, something takes place. Something call, comes alive. And the prophet Joel penned the words, in the end days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Young men will prophesy and old men will dream dreams. And then Peter on the day of Pentecost in the upper room comes down in the city square and begins to prophesy and declare and preach the, the words of Pentecost. And, he's, and he repeats that which was written, he repeats and he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We have not uh, relented from that hour. We are in that hour. We are amongst that prophecy. We are in that place of God's strategy. It is our time for the suddenly. I want you to poke your neighbor and say, it's my time. I want you to say it selfishly. Come on up the back. I want you to say it selfishly. It's my time. Mr. Besh, you're not poking anybody. You need to poke someone and tell them it's my time in Jesus' name. It's my time. God told me today, we're going we're gonna to turn the thermostat up for our suddenly. Let me tell you, these are not, this is not just a play on words. This isn't just an inspiring message. If you align your faith to receive, I'm telling you, God suddenly will hit your business and you will watch only God could have done that. God will hit your son and you go, wow, look what God just did in the heart of my son. And all of a sudden you look at your family and go, wow, I didn't know we've come so far that we've been restored so much and there's wholeness in what God is doing if we would just get ready for our suddenly. Everybody say suddenly. Oh, you guys are so easy to preach to. Number one is this, write this down. If we're gonna prepare ourselves for our suddenly, we gotta remind ourselves of his redeeming and restorative nature. Remind ourselves of his redeeming and restorative nature. Each person, we're made in the image of God, and each person has the likeness of God, and it's beautiful when I remember, and when I was thinking about one family member uh, when I was preparing this message, I thought of my great, great grandma Mabel. She was one of the pillars of the Lucas family. I mean, I mean, she was 5'2", just this militant little Christian woman, but she was dynamite. This woman could pray. This woman could, could, could step in and see miracles take place. And I remember when my dad would drop us off while he had to go to work, and I remember her bologna sandwiches. And I don't think I've eaten bologna since then, but uh, I remember her bologna sandwiches. And I remember the, the, the times of at the table playing Uno and her little tiny black and white TV that big. And I remember the Star Wars Legos that were under the couch. And I remember uh, her, her, the way she loved on us and the way she cared for us and her nature. And I mean, when you think back and remember who people are, when you actually take a glance, you just go, wow, she was just a powerful woman of God. And I'm standing here today as a man of God, a big reason because of her. And Ezekiel 39, 29 God says this, and I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God Almighty. What is he saying? In other words, when his spirit is poured out, his face is revealed. His nature is revealed. His characteristics are revealed. The Hebrew word for face in the Old Testament is presence. So the face of God equals his presence. We would talk about pursuing his presence. Ryan's talked about the youth. We're passionately pursuing his presence. We're passionately seeking the face of God. In other words, we want to understand the nature, the characteristics, his personality. A, person, a person's face reveals much about his or her character or personality. It, uh, you, can, you can see expressed outwardly that which they are feeling inwardly on their face. You can recognize a person by their face. So in essence, one's face represents the entirety of that person. You see, God's face equals his holy character. 
And in other words, the outpouring of his spirit always contains the face of God. So when we're worshiping and we're, and Charles is up here just going wild and Katie's going wild and all this amazing stuff, when we are worshiping, where two or three are gathered, there he is. And his presence is here, so he is revealing his face to you. He's revealing his nature. He wants to show you the fact of, of his goodness. And you are good, good. Whoa. What is he good for? He redeemed me. He redeemed you from the pit of addiction to meth. He redeemed you from the, from the pit of despair and, and depression and anxiety. He pulled you out of that place. He rescued you. He restored you. When you thought your, mar your marriage was going to go and sign those divorce papers, all of a sudden you rose up and said, not today, devil. God is restoring my heart, restoring my marriage. And we may have some scars, but those scars are going to be a testament to the goodness of God. When we pray, he reveals his face. He shows up. He begins to whisper. He begins to speak. It's amazing. When, we, when we're down, driving down the highway at 85 miles an hour, listening to praise the Lord, oh my soul, and we're just praising God, he begins to reveal who he is to you and I. And we are in this season of suddenlies, and God is pouring out his spirit and there is a nature of who he is that we must remind ourselves. You must remind yourselves that no matter how bleak your situation is, no matter how dark our nation looks, no matter what you are facing right now, he is a God that redeems. He is a God that restores. And Peter and the disciples had a first-hand witness from city to city watching Jesus. Wow. Wow. Healing that blind eye and, and those deaf ears and, and restoring that and the legion of demons that he cast out on the shore. And, and it's just amazing. He was giving them a first-hand witness. And I believe this generation needs to see a first-hand witness of you displaying the redeeming and restorative power of our God. And the Bible says throughout the Bible, spread that of, of his nature, Joel 2.25, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. In other words, if anything's been stolen from you, God promises I will return it. I remember when I first moved to Australia in 2001, I had 550 CDs. I'm talking about all my secular CDs and all my Christian CDs from DC Talk, Audio Adrenaline, Third Day, to Guns N' Roses, Metallica, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix, the whole, whole thing. I had 550 CDs in my car. Someone decided to take a bat to the window and steal all my CDs. So I got insurance, and I bought something for Becky, really nice. I didn't need those CDs anymore, but God will restore that which was stolen from you. Psalm 51, 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with willing spirit. David is crying out, restore God, the joy of my heart. And I have a word for someone. You walked in here with a very hard heart. You were forced to come. Your heart has been hardened. Almost, 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 almost um, traumatized by the church. And God's saying, as the word begins to just pour forth more and more, I'm going to melt your heart like ice in the midst of the sun. I'm going to restore your heart. Get ready for the joy of your salvation will be restored, says the Lord. See, God wants to restore. It's his motive. It's as his core. He is a redeemer. He's a restorer. He looks at circumstances and he says, I see potential. He looks at destruction and he says, I see potential. Even if there's only one brick, the first brick, the cornerstone brick to build the business that God has called you to build, yet I see not just the brick, I see the entire building. I see what I'm going to do. I see the potential because that is who he is. He is a redeemer and a restorer. Jeremiah 30, 17, and I will restore to you health and heal your wounds. This is who I am. When I come on the scene, I want to touch your body. When I come on the scene, I want to heal your body. When I come on the scene, I want to take and, and challenge your very intellect. Why? Because God is Jehovah Rapha and he is our healer. And I want to shake you up today because we cannot just come and to church and go, well, one day, well, one, someday God is going to touch my body. No, why don't we get a little bit radical and say, my day is suddenly and it's right here. God has showed up right now. I'm in the midst of his presence. Now God can do in something. Romans 8, 28, one of my favorite passages. And we know that all things work together. Everybody say work together. 
for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. See, he is able to reverse from tragedy to triumph, from failure to victory, from brokenness to wholeness. This is who he is. He has a turnaround nature. He is the king of comebacks. Let it sink in. Let it settle in that our God is a good God, but yet we face adversity. And this is where the enemy comes in. The parable in Mark 4 where Jesus begins to say where the word of God settles on different areas, on, on good, good soil and, and creates fruit, but then it, it can fall on other areas where uh, the enemy comes and strangles it. Mark 4, 7, 8 says this, Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. And the, the disciples go, what, what does that mean? Tell us what that means. And so he describes in Mark 4, 18, Still others, like seed, Sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So we want, we want the suddenly. We want this radical faith. We want to move in, in, amongst what God has called us to do in, in our purpose and calling and destiny. But yet adversity hits. Trials come, storms come, we see the mountain in front of us, and it says here that the devil loves, like weeds, to come and just squeeze the faith out of you. To take this word and, and squeeze it out of your heart so the seed of the suddenly is ripped from the soil and not blossomed on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And why? Because he says the worries of life. The worries of life happen, and if you break down the word worry, it's broken down into two words, divided and mind. Your mind becomes divided. All of a sudden, the deceitfulness of wealth. It doesn't say wealth is your adversary. No, it says the deceitfulness of wealth. That means that every single one of us, due to your revelation, have a lid of how much you can believe for and how much wealth you can attain before it starts attaining you. The desires for other things. That's simply Jesus and Jesus and, I'll, I'll keep that relationship and sleep around, even though we're not married. Jesus and, I'll, I'll just keep doing that addictive thing that I know is a behavior that is ungodly, but I'm just going to keep, Jesus and, where we start to do these things and they start to squeeze out the life of reminding us that Jesus is the turnaround God, that he can do the impossible in your life. That we are not just a, a, a self-help, great teaching, you know, inspiring, let's walk on coals of fire in this place. No, I'm telling you, God at the cross showed us that nothing is impossible. No sickness, no disease, no demonic attack, no oppression, no darkness in our land can come against the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. He is the God of the turnaround. He's on our side. He's in our corner. And he's powerful, and he's mighty, and he's telling it, uh, you and I, let him fight the battles. Let him have his way. Give that battle back to him and see God do incredible things. And we saw um, the enemy come uh, like an adversary when, at the Olympics just the other day, right? We saw the, the ceremony. We saw what took place. If you haven't uh, been online or social media, go, I mean, go look. It was a mockery of the Last Supper, and it was just insane, this mockery, and, and the devil's trying to use world platforms, uh, like the Woke NFL and Super Bowl halftime show, and uh, let's, let's, let, let me remind you, um, years ago when Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson uh, danced on the stage of the Super Bowl, and Justin Timberlake ripped off a part of her shirt and exposed her to the world, releasing uh, just once again, you guys understand, spiritually releasing the, the, the goddess of Ishtar, of sexual perversion into our nation. And, the, and, then, and then the platform of Rihanna, when she was doing demonic, satanic symbolism, uh, as she did her halftime show. Don't be, don't be, uh, don't be swayed or, or deceived. This is, this is in your face. It's blunt. It's real. And, and here we have a mockery. But my God says all things work together for good. That means he can even take the evil things and he can turn them for good. Even, even when the devil says, well, ha, ha, I'm going to spit in God's face and I'm going to mock the Last Supper. Well, guess what? The next day in Paris, complete blackout. Ben Fitzgerald. A mighty, mighty man of God started a church over in Europe, uh, obviously followed in the footsteps 
uh, of some mighty men of God, but Ben Fitzgerald and his team were on the ground. As soon as that mockery happened at the opening ceremony, their evangelists were on the ground, and one day they saw 45 people give their hearts to Christ. I mean, and not just that, I was sent a graph, an online graph. So after the Last Supper mockery, all of a sudden this graph showed the interest, everybody Googling and, and looking up, what is the Last Supper? So what devil meant for good pointed everybody to look to Jesus and see what he did and said at the Last Supper. Let me tell you, our God is a God of victory. The devil cannot take the victory away. He is just throwing a little tantrum right now. Because he knows the clock is counting down. You know in his man cave, the devil's man cave, he's got a clock. It's his clock, and it says, until the pit of fire, the lake of fire, just, it's coming. He has to remind himself that he has been defeated. Number two is this, Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, now faith, if I could have the keys out, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So let's not quickly brisk past that. So now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You can read that a few ways. You can read it in the sense of now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of not seen. But I saw it and my Holy Spirit just showed me, he goes, no, no, it's now faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So really, it depends on your hope that will lead you into an exchange of the substance of now faith. Okay? So I want to ask you this question. You need to evaluate what you're hoping in. You need to evaluate what you're hoping in. Because your hope for this state can introduce your suddenly. Your hope for your marriage can introduce your suddenly. It's powerful when we understand Faith and hope are two different subjects. We can't just go, yeah, faith, hope, they work together. Yeah, but no, they're actually two different subjects. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So hope is futuristic. Faith is now. Hope is one day. I'm going to hope in tomorrow. But faith says now. Activated now. Used and released now. And see, one day I'll get the promotion. That's hope. Hope. It's, it's, it's hoped for. Is, it's a past tense. Past tense means an action that already happened or a state that previously existed. So I can't say I'm, I'm going to get my truck next. Uh, I, I can't wait to get my truck. And that's faith. That's not faith. I'm hoping that one day I look in my driveway and there's a black truck. One day, there's going to be the biggest jacked up truck you've ever seen in your life in my driveway. I promise you, that's what I've been praying for. It's going to be so amazing. But I can't, I can't say tomorrow at 10 a.m., I'm going to sit with my boss and get my promotion. That's faith. No, it's not faith. It's you're hoping for that. The hope for is past tense. It's futuristic. And your presence... Your present moment needs to collide with the hope that you have been hoping for. Just like Mark 5, the lady with the issue of blood for 12 years, she spent all her money on the doctors, and she's now in this place, and she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, we can say, whoa, wow, that's great faith. Wow, that's amazing faith. No, it's hope. She's hoping that, man, if she could just see Jesus walk through the crowd, that she could just get to his hem of his garment. And if she could just touch from what she's heard, I'm hoping that if I can do that, she could have easily just gone, I'm hoping one day Jesus will come. And she's sitting in her rocking chair at home in pain with the issue of blood. I'm hoping one day I'm praying. God, I'm praying, I'm, I'm interceding, I'm believing, I'm going to church, I'm going to the temple every day. God, you know, years go by and years go by, she could still be hoping at 84 with no change. It wasn't until that moment where the hope exchanged for the substance of faith, where she broke through the crowd. 
She didn't care if her elbow hit that eye socket. She didn't care if her knee hit that hip. She didn't care what she had to do to get through that crowd to touch the hem of the garden. And all of a sudden, she touched the hem of a garden. She felt the supernatural power of the healing power of God touch her body. And Jesus turns around and she, he says, wow, that was great faith. It was an exchange. So let me ask you this question. What are you hoping in? Have you lost hope for this generation? Have you lost hope in much of the darkness? Darkness is just the absence of light. When light shows up, darkness has to flee. That means when you and I show up in the entertainment industry, darkness flees. When you and I show up in the educational realm, darkness flees. When you and I rise up and we actually vote this year, 22% of Colorado voted. Come on, Christians. We got to do our due diligence. We got to rise up. Faith is the substance of things you once hoped for. I got that black car in my driveway. That's faith. I got a ring on that woman's finger. That's faith. That's faith. For too long, the church has been, has been has, has, I felt lived in Proverbs 13, 12, where hope deferred makes the heart sick. Because if you lose hope, your faith suffers. How can you be hopeful, or not hopeful, and your faith radical? You just can't. You damage your faith by losing hope. But Proverbs 13, 12 in the message says, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. It's powerful. So John 11, Martha speaking to Jesus and after Lazarus dies. Lazarus was one of Jesus' best friends. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, your brother will be raised. This is Martha's reply. I know, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. I know. Jesus, I know. This is Martha standing right in front of Jesus. I get it. One day he'll be raised. Someday in the future, someday on the timeline of history, I get it. Yeah, one day. I know, I know, one day. And Jesus looks at her and goes, hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. Best said in the message translation in John eleven twenty five, 25, he goes, you don't have to wait for the end. It's like, woman, you don't have to wait for the end. You don't have to wait, why? Because I am, ever say I am? Ever say right now? Say I am? Say right now? Say I am? Say right now? He says, I am right now the resurrection and the life. I am right now. I'm in front of you, I'm right here. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? I am resurrection and life. And lastly is this. So we gotta evaluate our hope, but we have to develop a lifestyle of right now faith. We have to develop a lifestyle of right now faith. Right now. This is the faith. It's the now faith that pleases our God. It's the now faith. It's not the faith that we, that we go, we grab it off the tree. Oh, I got some great faith here. I'm just gonna put in my bag. I'm gonna get some more faith over here. Oh, I'm gonna go to this conference. Oh, that's good faith. I like that, I'm gonna put that in my bag. And all of a sudden, it rots. And we've done nothing with it. But God wants us, just like Genesis was, to the now faith. God said, and there was. John G. Lake, an incredible revivalist, mighty man of God, he was at a university. And the university was doing a test. And they were testing deadly germs. Like deadly germs. Like don't touch these germs to your skin, otherwise it could be deadly, right? And so John G. Lake, in his crazy now faith, says, watch this. Puts his hand in the area where the box was, where the deadly germs, and they, they, they're they astonished. So they took the magnifying glass, they put it on his skin, and all of a sudden, as the deadly germs touched his skin, the deadly germs died. No weapon formed against me will prosper because I am so entrusting, my faith is in such a good God that no matter where he sends me, he will not leave or forsake. 
forsake me. Smith Wigglesworth, another mighty man of God. I loved him. He rose 14 people from the dead. 14. 14. And the first person was his wife. And hear this. He wasn't the mighty man of God with the, with the platform and the microphone when he did it. He was a plumber. He was out and about doing the everyday, the work of society, right? He was a plumber. He comes home, the doctor, he opens the door to the doctor. The doctor hands him the death certificate of his wife and says, I'm so sorry. We were called, your wife died. Here's her death certificate. We'll, we'll get everything to deal with it later. And he goes, my wife is not dead. So he walks into the room, picks up his wife, puts her in the corner, gets on his knees, looks in their eyes, and she says, come alive now in Jesus' name. She opens her eyes, and, she, and, and she, this is what she said. She goes, why did you call me back? They might have had some marriage issues, but anyways. <laughs> why did you call me back? Like, it's now faith. Makes our lives a living testament of God's power. You and I are living examples of the power of God if we live in the realm of now faith. If, not, if we're on that place of one day, someday it's gonna happen. And, and if you're new to City Point, two years ago, we declared a revival resolve in this house. Ah, oh, they're just about revival. They're just about the fire of God. They're just about healing at City Point. They're about this and that. Well, a revival resolve says, I want to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It is a promise that is not given to you and I with any parameters. It is a promise that is given to you and I without any boundaries. It is not limited in any way, shape, or form. I, myself, this, my head between this ear and this ear is the only limitation to the kingdom of God advancing in this world. If I would just step into a now faith, but we just say, God, we beg God, one day, God, one day Colorado can turn its ways. One day Colorado can come to Christ. And we get in this posture where we start to look at the darkness, we get intimidated by the darkness, and we start to beg a God that has already sovereignly poured out his spirit upon all flesh. And he said, my work is done. Your work has just begun. Get busy, my son. Get busy, my daughter. Start to step in your now faith and start to see what God can do in and through you in this hour but yet as the, as the church of Jesus Christ we come to church we're Christians that come I'm good and I'm I'm a faithful Christian and I come to church if you just come to church you can leave church if you just come to church, you can leave church. My friends, Jesus did not die on the cross for us just to come church. To Jesus died on the cross for you and I to become the church of Jesus Christ. He's not on the cross, and God the Father didn't say, hey, my son, what you're doing, purchased 90 minutes for the body to be at a service for on Sundays. No, he purchased you and I so that Sundays we can be refueled and refocused and re-empowered and recommissioned and that Monday we can make a stand, Tuesday we can preach Jesus, Wednesday we can be a light, Thursday we can preach the word of God and Friday we can invite someone to come to the gathering. We gather as the church, Not we, we don't come to church, we gather as the church so we can leave and scatter as the church and go reach into every society, parts of society and see God move, but it demands a now faith. But if, if, if we just go, Pastor Aaron, I really believe, I sound like Forrest Gump, I really, I really believe that God is sovereign and he'll move in his sovereign timing. He will, I really, I just believe that. He'll move in his sovereign timing. Why do we have to just keep pressing for revival and keep pushing, keep believing? I, I believe, sorry, Ryan. If it's, if, it's, if it's moving into that southern twang, I didn't, I, there's no, there's no. But what happens? If we keep teaching, sovereignty of God will happen. One day, we become inactive. It's not demanding. And let me just tell you, if anybody tries to teach you a theology that doesn't man something of you right now, it's not Christ. It demands us to rise.
demands us to be the light, to be the church. And if we just keep going, it's coming. Or it's a sovereign. Charles Finney goes, that sovereign theology that God will one day do it, that's from the devil. That's a lie. That's what the revivalist Charles Finney said. But if we say it's coming one day, we keep pointing to the future, it's coming. If we keep teaching that, what's, it will never be demanding. If we keep teaching that, it will be inspiring. But what happens is we'll leave this building and we'll go back to who we were. Nothing will change. Nothing will transform. Nothing will change on Tuesday nights at the City Council of Loveland. Nothing will change at the school board meetings. Nothing will change uh, in the political arena. Nothing will change in, in the trajectory of Colorado if we just come to a service and sit and we go out into the world and we don't change. We're more, the church has been more about future casting than stewarding our present moments. The, the church has been more about preoccupied about what's coming and it's robbed us of our effectiveness right now. That I have a seed that I can sow right now a seed of time, a seed of treasure, a seed of talent, I can sow it right now because I have now faith. And this now faith is going to make the difference. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the accepted time. We don't need to pray for another Pentecost moment. Acts 2 already happened. We are living in the hour of our suddenly if you would just say God you're the redeemer you're the restorer and I'm putting my hope that gosh at any given moment anything can happen at any given moment you're suddenly can just that anxiety just leave cancer destroyed in your body come on any given moment that suddenly you can get that promotion you've been praying for that suddenly where all of a sudden your your family starts to come into church and they give their lives to Christ there was a young girl in the last service she just she's engaged and she's about to move to Michigan and she comes and she's crying and weeping at the altar she wasn't saved but she gave her heart to Christ and she's going to go to Michigan and guess what her father-in-law is a pastor her suddenly was in that moment positioning and preparing her God is so good he is so good. He is so good. This is our moment. Can we put our hands towards heaven? Oh, Father, every, every man, woman, and child in this room, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We, we receive the prophetic, prophetic utterance that it's time for our suddenly. I receive it. God, let, let, let my faith not be dormant. Let my faith not be inactive. Let my faith not, not be standstill. Let me not remain in that place of hope, but my, let my hope be exchanged into the substance of now faith. Now faith, now is the time. This present moment, this present hour, now, to do something now, to say something now, to, to decree something now, to give something now, to move. I am the move of God. God in me, Jesus in me. God can work through us as the body of Christ if we would just say it is our time. It is our time for the suddenly. The harvest is now. The harvest is now, you said, Jesus. You said it's ripe, it's ready, that there's hearts ready to be engaged. That means that the, the people that are, 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 are in the new age uh, religion and they're, they're, they're dabbling with those tarot cards and they're in those things, that they're ready now to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Muslims that are, that are flooding into this nation, immigrants that are flooding into this nation are ready, they're prepared, that you mean they're ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're ready, they're, it's, it's ready, it's now, God, it's, it's, it's ready. If we would just say yes, God, create the urgency inside of us, God. Create the urgency inside of us. Create that God inside of us. As suddenly, Father, I pray for the gift of faith to fall in this place, the gift of now faith, that there, are, there is a step that every single person in this room must take tomorrow. A step, just one step. Doesn't mean three steps, four steps, five steps. One step, and every every single person in this room knows what that step is. One person in this room, you got to pick up that Bible. You got to start reading your Bible again. One person in this room, you need to get on your knees and you need to pray. One person in this room, you need to pick up your phone and you need to text your father. One person in this room, you need to you need to stand up and say, Hey, I'm going to get my business back on the train of righteousness. Come on, one one step. What is that step? God, give us a gift of faith to step into that. Step into that. Step into that, God, so we can be a part of this season of suddenlies.
in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Can we have every hand raised towards heaven? Come on. I exalt all thee. And I exalt all thee. I exalt thee. Oh, oh. come on, let's look ahead. We exalt you, God, and all alone, and I exalt thee, and I Just begin to thank him in this place. Just begin to thank him. Lift your voices. Come on, for the next 60 seconds, lift up a heart of gratitude. Come on, lift up a heart of gratitude. Jesus, for every seed sown today, God, for every revelation sown today, God, for what your word did in our hearts today, God, we thank you, Father. We thank you, God. Let gratitude, let gratitude, come on, be the be the gardener today. Let gratitude be the gardener today, God. That seed ready to blossom. That seed of the suddenly ready to blossom, God. That it can happen at any moment, at any time. It can happen right now in Jesus' mighty name. Come on. If you're still sick in this place, come on, if you're dealing with arthritis, if you're dealing with a tumor in your body, come on, if you're dealing with a deaf ear, if you're dealing with a, a, a slight blindness in your left eye, come on, begin to thank him today. Begin to lift up gratitude that you are right now in the name of Jesus healed. Come on, thank him for that healing in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you're financially suffering in this hour of economic hardship, come on, begin to thank him. Come on, that he has a treasury in heaven that has unlimited resource. Begin to thank him. Come on, the angels are already on their way. They have already been assigned to your address. They're getting ready to come and show up and give you the breakthrough and the blessing that you need in Jesus' mighty name. God says that you will not go without even the sparrows I take care of, says the Lord. God is doing something you. You do not have to worry. I see God dissipating that worry and replacing it with faith. You are going to take, God is using this hour, this moment, this situation, that he is using it to form you and forge you and build you and equip you, that you're going to be bigger, you're going to be stronger, you're going to be mightier, you're going to step out of the cave of the wallowness and the stealth pity, and you're going to step into strength and courage and might. Today is the day, says the Lord. You are a mighty man of God. You are a mighty woman of God. Do not let the devil whisper lies in your ears. Do not let the devil take you down and water you down and pull you down and keep you dormant. No, God says, arise, my son. Arise, my daughter. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time in Jesus' mighty name. It's time in Jesus' mighty name. It's time for our suddenly. Oh, Father, can we lift up every church in this region? Can we lift up every church in this region? Come on, that they're, they're about to hit their suddenly. Every church in this region is about to hit their suddenly. There's going to be an encounter with God. Come on, lift, begin to lift up. If God puts a church on your heart, name it by name. Come on, name it by name. Come on, if he puts a pastor on your heart, name it by name. Name her by name. Come on, Father, in the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit upon all flesh. It means everybody. It means every community. It means every gathering. Holy Spirit, right now, in Jesus' name, Colorado will not be the same. Colorado will not be the same. Father, Holy Spirit, you desire for 
for every community, Father, to move, to operate, to usher in heaven on earth in the name of Jesus because that is your promise. That is your command in Jesus' mighty name. So we thank you for every pastor and leader, for the church to rise to his place of influence that it's meant to be in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. From the front to the back, left to the right. I know the kids' pastors don't like when we go over. But from the front to the back, left to the right, I want to ask you this question. Are you saved? Don't tell me you're just a church-going Christian. That's not salvation. Have you been supernaturally converted? Has your stony heart been replaced with a brand new born again heart? Do you see the fruit of the Spirit on your life? Do you hear the voice of God? Do do, 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 do you just burn for Jesus? My friend, He wants to redeem you. He wants to pull you out of the, the path to hell and He wants to put you on the path to heaven. He's knocking on the door of your heart, and he says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. You will be. You will be. It's not, it's not working our way like the Buddhism or, or any other religion. It's you will be saved. Jesus is here, and he's ready to gift you the greatest eternal gift called salvation. On the count of three, if that's you and you want to get saved, just raise your hand right now. One, two, three. If you want to get saved right now, just raise your hand. Say, yes, Pastor Aaron, please pray with me now. I want to be saved. Maybe you may not know. I, I, I don't know if I'm saved. Right now, raise your hands. Right now, raise your hands in this place. I want to make sure everybody in this room. Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. One more time. Join with me. Put your hands towards heaven. Father, bless this house. Lord, bless, bless, bless this house in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Father. Every single one of us receive this prophetic, prophetic word that it's our day of suddenly. It's our day that God is going to show up and everybody that looks and sees what God, what, what has happened is going to say, wow, only God could have done that. It is the season of suddenly. So bless this house in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, come on, let's give God a shout of praise. Come on now.